Turn your Bibles with me, please, would, to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. And keeping your finger in Matthew chapter 4, turn to James chapter 5. Matthew chapter 4 and James chapter 5. Matthew chapter 4 and James chapter 5. If you have the, once you get the place, stand with me and we'll read a couple of verses together. And I'm going to preach fast, try to preach fast. Because I've got a lot of territory I want to cover. If you got the place in your Bible, say amen. amen. All right, look with me. Jesus training his disciples. He did that partially by how he called them, entering his public ministry. Look with me at Matthew chapter 5. And we see something that's very, very interesting to look at. Look at verses 18 and 19. In Matthew chapter 5, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. The Bible said, And Jesus, walking by the sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew's brother. They were casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. By the way, this is not the first time these two men had seen, seen Jesus. But verse 19 is significant. And he, Jesus said unto them, read it aloud with me, Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. That's a great principle. If we follow, he'll do the making. A lot of times we're more concerned about what we can do than following Jesus and doing what he said. Jesus said, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And so he did. We'll see later on. By the time you get to the end of the book of Acts and through the epistles, these men harvested souls. Revival and soul when he was alive. Follow me. And can I say this? If years after that they were not harvesting souls, they were not following Jesus. You can graduate from a Bible college and get a Ph.D. degree in five languages, but if you're not winning souls, you're not following Jesus, according to the Bible. Now, look with me very carefully. We're going to skip over to James chapter 5, verses 18 and 19. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, Put in the margin, that word truth is the gospel. The gospel. We heard in Sunday school about works and grace. These Judaizers were trusting works and not grace. If you've got the gospel, you understand the salvation is by grace. So the truth there is the gospel. If any of you heard from the gospel, watch this, and one convert him. Don't just skip over that. One convert him. Let him know. Now, if I had a big billboard up here and I had flashing lights and neon lights, I would say James is flashing something at five chapters in the end of a book that dealt with many, many different parts of how to serve Jesus Christ. But then he comes to the end and he said, let him know. What have I got to know? What is it we ought to know? The Bible says that he which converted the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death. So stop for a minute. That death is the second death. That means if you convert a sinner from the earth's way, you're going to keep somebody from going to hell. That's not the end of it. And she'll hide a multitude of sin. He's going to get a brand new life right now. See, that's two things the soul winner does. Actually, if you look at it very carefully, this verse and this passage helps us to understand right in the middle of one of the greatest Revival and soul winning errors this world has ever had. We'll go into it a little bit more later. But right in the middle of that, this verse will help us to understand, keep at it. Keep doing what you did to make you successful. Most people that start, they get successful, quit doing what they did to make them successful and coast the rest of their life. James is saying, don't do that. Lord, I pray that you guide our hearts, guide our minds, Help me to, God, reflect upon that which you would have me to say in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Be seated if you would, please. Look at verses 19 and 20 for just a minute. First of all, the word one in verse 19. One, convert him. Then in verse 20, the word him. Also the second, he. One, him, he. Those three words refer to the same person, and that is a soul winner. A soul winner. Let this one person know that converts him. Let him know that he that converts the sinner, that's the soul winner. Now the word converteth and convert in verse 19 and converteth in verse 20 is biblical soul winning. 
biblical. So that's the practice. One is the person, the other is the practice. That word converteth means persuades. It means leads. It means helps. It means very simply, you take somebody from this position to this position, and you notice very carefully, you and I know God does the saving. Can I get an amen? amen. God's the only one who can do the saving, but if this is the only verse you had, you'd be wondering who did the converting. Because it says him and he does the converting. You know what that means? When you are a soul winner, a biblical soul winner, you are in partnership with God. There's no way to be any closer to God than when you are practicing biblical soul winning. Now, this elevation should not shock us because all the way through the Scripture, the priority of soul winning, I mean, in all of the Bible, is very current. What did the psalmist say? He that forth goeth weeping, bearing precious seeds, shall doubtless come again, bearing his seeds with him. What's he talking about? You see, the roots of soul winning are thoroughly entrenched in the Old Testament. What he's talking about, I ought to have a broken heart. I ought to care about people. It ought to mean something to me if somebody my, that's close to me dies and goes to hell and I've never done anything about it. I've never tried to help them. So the Bible, what does the psalmist say? Have a broken heart. That's Old Testament, not New Testament. But the roots don't stop there. What does Proverbs 11.30 say? Where you say the only part I know is he that winneth souls is wise. So you get wisdom. Can I tell you, I've been preaching this book a long time. Some of the wisest people I know are soul winners. Even lay soul winners who may not have had Bible college training. There's a special wisdom that God gives to soul winners. But don't miss the first part of Proverbs 11.30. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. What in the world does that mean? That means that every born-again child of God is righteous because we are righteous in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And the fruit of the righteous is the tree of life. You say, well, I understand that every Christian ought to have love, joy, peace, long-suffering. Friend, that's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And the fruit of the Holy Spirit ought to be evident in my life and your life as we follow God. But the fruit of a Christian is not love, joy, and peace. That's the fruit of the Holy Spirit through us. The fruit of a Christian is another person being saved. The fruit of a Christian is a Christian. And the issue is, are we bearing fruit? That's Old Testament. Well, we keep going, and what does Ezekiel te teach us? When I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest thee not warning, nor speaketh to warn the wicked from the wicked way, to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thy hand. I want to tell you what, that verse challenges me and to some extent scares me. I need to be witnessing to everybody I possibly can. That's Old Testament. That's accountability. We will one day be accountable unto God. What about Daniel chapter 12 and verse 3? Remember that great, great verse, and they shall, that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. You know what that's dealing with? One of the five crowns that are given at the judgment seat of Christ after the rapture, the crown of rejoicing, the soul in his crown. Very little do we think about that. That's what Paul was talking about in 1 Thessalonians 2 when he said to the Christians there, for what is our hope or our joy or our crown of rejoicing? He said, it's you, those that had won to Christ. He wrote exactly the same thing to the church at Philippi. Therefore, my brethren, dearly believe it along for, you are my crown and my joy. You know, one of the things I think we sometimes do is we think about these things and we kind of relate them to a certain thing. I want you to look at the Bible as a complete unit. In the Old Testament, the roots of soul winning is there, but march into the Gospels with me. Wow, we get into the Gospels, what do we find? That Jesus Christ himself established soul winning and defined what Bible soul winning is. Now please understand that second part of what I said. Jesus defined what soul winning was. Because I want to tell you, the Christian world around us today has defined it ten different ways. 
And by defining it in different ways, they've taken responsibility off of the church, responsibility off of the shoulders of Christians, and we no longer feel any need to do it, and they've given us excuses where we no longer are under the blame or the responsibility we have. Biblical soul winning. What did Jesus do? He got his disciples together and he called them. I read you out of, how did he call his disciples? He didn't walk up and say, go to Bible college. He didn't walk up and say, let me check your life out and see how you're living. What did he say? I'm looking for somebody that will follow me and let me make them a fisher of men. I found something out. If you will train a soul winner, you will mature him beyond his years. Somebody said, well, as soon as a person gets saved, how long before they can win somebody to Christ? How about the same day they get saved? We've had that to happen many, many times. But we want to check people out. We want to set people aside and let them meet a criteria. I'll say more about that later. But what's happened to us, to some extent, we have lost eagerness and passion and desire to do what? To follow Jesus and win people to Jesus Christ. In the midst of his training for three years of these 12 disciples, he gathered them to one place in Luke chapter 19 and verse 10. He said, guys, you need to know why I have come. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Now, you can take away from that. You can add to it, but we should do neither because Jesus said exactly what he meant. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save. Now, why did he put seeking before the saving? Because he was going to do the saving. When he died on the cross and came up out of the grave, hey, the possibility for every human being on this earth to have their sin forgiven and not go to hell and go to heaven was made a reality when Jesus came up out of the grave. Every human being. The problem is nobody's seeking them. The weakness in the mission statement of Jesus was not the saving, it's the seeking because that's where we let the ball down sometimes. But then if you really want to look at something, come to the end of his ministry. What happened? False trial, guilty, crucifixion, death, burial. And that's the end. Or was it just the beginning? Because three days and three nights later, up from the grave he arose. And when he died on the cross, it was not the end it was the beginning. Three days later, the gospel was complete. But wait a minute. 43 days later, something else happened. 43 days later, Jesus stood on the mount outside of Jerusalem and ascended up into heaven. What happened from that third day to that 40th day? You ever thought about that? It's called, I've kind of talked about it, the post-resurrection ministry of Jesus. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 2, the Bible tells us he gave some commandments to his disciples during that time. Now, we have coined two words and put it together we're very familiar with, and those commandments have been grouped together in what we call the Great Commission. How many folks have wave at me if you've heard that term, Great Commission? I know every one of you have. So why do you want us to do that? Because 51% of the people in the world today have never heard the Great Commission. I'm talking about people to go to church. It's not talked about much. The Great Commission is not given. You say, well, I want to read it in one spot. You can't. You have to read it in five parts. It takes a combination of all five parts to understand what the Great Commission is. If I were to give it to you in biblical order, it would be Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the first chapter of Acts. But studying in a chronological order is where it's revealing. So I want you to walk through that 40 days with me. Would you do that for just a minute? Day number one, I'd have to take you to John chapter 20. I mean, the very night after he came up out of the grave, the first day, he met those men. He said, <laughs> I want you to know something. As the Father sent me, so send I you. Jesus said, I will be your mentor. Can I say something to you? If we we'll obey what God gave us to do during those days, what a mentor we have. The Lord Jesus Christ himself. Think about it. Like the Father sent me, here's what Jesus said to you, not to preachers, not to evangelists, but to every born-again child of God. He said, just like the Father sent me, so send I you. Wow. One week later, on the eighth day, now we're in the eighth day of that 40 days, he met them again in Jerusalem. 
And this time we have to go to Mark chapter 16. And in Mark chapter 16, he said, Amen. I told you I was going to be a mentor. Now I want you to preach the gospel to every creature. What? It's your job to preach the gospel to every creature. He gave them, the mentor gave them a mission to preach the gospel to every creature. And if I was there, I'd say, how am I going to do that? I mean, how are we going to get it done? But then go two weeks later, on day number 23, he sent them up into Galilee. That's a three days journey. And he went up there, and I don't know how long he stayed with them, maybe a couple of days. That's where he gave Matthew chapter 28. And in Matthew chapter 28, he gave them the method to get the mission accomplished. If they followed the method he gave them, they could accomplish the mission. It is a four-step method. What is it? Number one is to go. And then when it says teach all nations, that means we are supposed to present the gospel. You say, wait a minute. I have been told that the job of the church is to go and make disciples. That's because you've been listening to the wrong people. You say, don't you believe in discipleship? More than you'll ever know. I just happen to believe you've got to get a guy saved before you can disciple him. And it confuses people to say that soul winning and discipleship are the same thing. They're not. Soul winning is when you went into Christ. Discipleship is when you disciple him to where he can reproduce. That's what disciple. So when Jesus said, go and teach all nations, he's telling me to go and teach the gospel because the gospel is what he just told us in Mark chapter 16 that I'm supposed to give up to every creature. When you meet somebody, you want to teach them? Yeah, teach them they're a sinner. Teach them because they're a sinner, they're going to die and spend an eternity in hell. Teach them that Jesus died on the cross, the very Son of God, and paid the penalty for their sin. Teach them that they'll believe that and receive Christ, that God will save them. That's our job, is to present the gospel. That's what Ezekiel was talking about. And if we don't do that, we're going to stand before God, give an account for it. That's our job. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Boy, I wish I had time to park here for a while. I do not. Because actually, when you begin to get to this point, we fail to understand the real potential of that. Here's what he said, the four steps. Number one, every day while you're going. Number two, I want you to teach somebody, give them the gospel. Number three, build a relationship. Get them in the church and get them baptized. And number four, you teach them to do for somebody else exactly what has been done for them. Amen. That's reproduction. That's the definition of a soul winner. Somebody often comes to me and said, does the Bible give us a definition? A soul winner is somebody that every day while he's going, according to the Bible, Every day while he's going, he's looking for an opportunity to do what? To tell somebody the gospel. If he's able to win them, he tries to build a relationship and get them in church to where they can be baptized. And simultaneously, he's discipling them with the goal of them knowing how to win somebody else. And brother, I'll tell you, if you practice that, you will invest your life in the greatest thing you've ever invested in. Because the first part of Proverbs 11 says, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. I'll show you how that works. I asked Dwight and Kathy if it would be all right if I told you this story. And they said, well, all right. No, they said they'd be very happy, very happy for me to do so. And uh, I might get the dates wrong, but on September the 1st, 1974, am I right, Kathy? Kathy is, a, I didn't even know she was born back then. But anyway, the church I was pastoring, she walked in on Sunday night. You said bad time to come. Not a bad time to come. We got the gospel every service. And we baptized every service. The people that got saved, just like it did in Acts. Kathy walked the aisle. Now you correct me if I'm wrong. Kathy walked the aisle, and a trained soul winner led her to Christ on the front pew and introduced her the need to be baptized as soon as she gets saved. She said, okay. Kathy got baptized the same night she got saved. She went home and she told him before she left church, she said, don't go visit Dwight. I said, why is that? He's a Mormon. She said, don't go visit him now. You run him off. I got thinking about it. Where are you going to run a guy off that's lost? Hell number two or hell number three? I mean, think about that. <laughs> so she said, don't go visit Dwight. <laughs> and am I right? Dwight, y'all lived in a trailer then, I believe. So I took June with me to defend me on Thursday night. 
I found out later when Kathy got home at night, Dwight said, I thought you went to church. I did. Well, what's your hair doing wet? She got saved and got baptized. And on Thursday, Dwight sat down and listened to the gospel, and I led him to Christ on Thursday night. That next Sunday, Dwight walked the aisle and made it public. I don't care what I preached on that Sunday when I gave the invitation. I knew I was going to have one forward. We had already won him. One of the great things in the world is to have about 10 soul winners walking in the auditorium before you preach. Say, I won somebody, I got them here. I won somebody, I got them here. You can preach anything you want to. When you finish preaching, you give an invitation. People walk the aisle because they've been saved. You train soul winners to do that. And so Dwight walked the aisle and he left that Sunday morning with wet hair. Amen. What's that, 48 years ago? Am I right? 48 years ago. Now watch. That's addition. He that winneth souls is wise. That's addition. Dwight, have you won somebody of the Lord since you've been saved? Absolutely. I know you have. I'm just asking. Dwight's a great soul winner. Now, when he wants somebody of the Lord, that's multiplication. Now, the people you want of the Lord, you try to disciple them to where they could win somebody of the Lord. And when they want somebody of the Lord, that's multiplication for him is multiplied greatly for me. Here's what it's like. June and I got married. We didn't have any children. It wasn't long we had four children. I said, whoops. I bet you all four of these will be teenagers one day. You know what? It wasn't long before we had grandchildren. I've lived long enough now. We got great grandchildren. That's what a soul winner ought to be. Everybody in this building that's been saved ought to be able to look back and say, I've got spiritual children, spiritual grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. That's exactly how this method works in Matthew chapter 28. That's the reason that church exploded. Like I said, I just wish I had time to go into it. I'm going to skip this part. I'm going to let you skip get into this part. Because when Jesus finished, now watch Acts chapter 2, one, verse two, I've given you commandments to be obeyed. Verse three, he proved himself to be alive by many infallible proofs. And then all of a sudden the disciples, hold it, I got a question. I know you said you're going to be the mentor. I know you said we got a mission. I know you said we got a mess. And I know you said we've got a method to get it done. But I got a question. What's your question? Are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel at this time and knock off all the Romans and set your kingdom up today and let us be an authority on this earth? Jesus said, hold it, guys. It's not for you to know the times and seasons. Now, if we were to ask that same question today, and please do not misunderstand, I'm an American from the bottom of my foot to the top of my head. My blood beats red off of what the preacher was talking about. It hadn't changed. And I think we are honored and privileged to be citizens of this great nation. And I love America. But I want to say to you that if I were to take Acts chapter 1 and put it in today's you know, words, it would be something like, Jesus, is Donald Trump going to be elected president again? Are the Republicans going to take over the Congress? Now, those things are important civilly for what we're doing as a citizen here. But here's, I think, what Jesus would say. Hold it. It's not for you to know the times of the seasons. Then come to verse 8. But you are going to receive power. And that power is going to enable you to be the soul and the witness I told you about. And you're going to do it in where? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, other most parts of the earth. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid that the means, the study of the Holy Spirit and understanding of the Holy Spirit is our means of getting the gospel to the whole world. That's what God's called us to do. Two years. That's all I want to say about Acts 1. Boy, I wish I had time to go into what the harvest, because the harvest shows the priority. You know, when you come to the book of Acts, And then the Bible says, Acts 2, 41, God added 3,000. Can you imagine how difficult it was to baptize 3,000? 
I don't think one person did it all. I think they all was participating in it. He called all to do it. Acts 2.47, God added to church daily. Acts 4.4, 4, the men became 5,000 men. If you got 5,000 men, 5,000 ladies, and three children per family, that's 23,000 people that have been saved and baptized. Imagine that. Bible scholars that deal with this, and very few do, say there were sometime around 25,000 at that point who had been saved and baptized. You say, how did they do it? One by one. Every day that were going, they were winning people. Seven days a week. And while they were winning people, they baptized them. Then they trained them to go do the same thing they were doing. And now you got two doing it. Then you had four doing it. Then you had eight doing it. That's how they got 3,000. That's how they got 5,000 men. You keep reading. The Bible said in Acts 5, 42, daily in every house they did this. Can you imagine that? In Acts chapter 6 and verse 1, the number multiplied. Then in Acts chapter 6 and verse 8, the Bible says the number multiplied greatly. And God said, wait a minute, you're doing a pretty good job in Jerusalem. He brought persecution in Acts 8, 4. They were scattered everywhere. And God took a renegade named Saul, saved him, made him an evangelist and called him Paul. He traveled around and established churches. And you study carefully, you'll find everywhere he went, there were pockets of Christians doing the same thing in other countries. That's the reason. It's not long when you find that people in Asia had heard the gospel. And a few years later, you find that people worldwide had heard the gospel because God's method works that way. That's what God's given us to do. You know, Satan has always been against the work of God. Church history records it. You ought to read Fox Book of Martyrs. Whatever you do, the price was paid for us to have a Bible. The price was paid for us to have the truth. And everybody in here ought to read Fox Book of Martyrs. American history is the second thing we ought to read, how this country was founded on Christian principles. I think one of the reasons we've had the blessings of God is because, now listen carefully, we had great revivals and soul winning. You cannot separate in the Bible revivals and soul winning. You can't separate them. They go hand in hand. It's God that's woven them together. And there was great revivals. What we do not know, and maybe you didn't know, is currently is in the 60s and 70s, there was a great thrust of revival in America. Did you know that? The largest church in all 50 states at the end of the 60s and going to the 70s was a fundamental Baptist soul winning church. I hope you picked up on what I said. The largest church in number, it was not somebody on television over here saying, be better, let me tell you how to feel better about yourself and how to stroke yourself. That's not what it was about. The largest church in all 50 states was a fundamental church that believed the Bible's the word of God, preached it just like here, and practiced soul winning revival. If you were to go to the members of the church in those days, in fact, when Kathy and Dwight were saved, you go to the church in those days and say, what is your church about? Revival and soul winning. I've asked over 20 people in the last four or five months, what is church about today? They said, edifying the saints. They say, learning more about the Bible. Are those things important? Yeah. The problem with error, there's always enough truth in it to make people believe it. And so we need edification. We need growth. But you know what we build? is Dead Sea Christians. Dead Sea Christians. Our churches. What's happened to us? Oh, we know a lot about the Bible. And we check all the boxes. We're straight. We got all the boxes straight. So what if you don't win about to Christ? So what if nobody gets saved? All you're doing is decorating yourself to look better before Jesus comes back. You know what the Dead Sea was? The lowest tributary in the area. The richest place. All the gold, all the minerals that came into the Dead Sea. If somebody could get that, they'd have one of the richest places they could harvest and make money out of. You know what the Dead Sea didn't have? It did not have any tributaries reaching out to water the farmlands. If it had, it was too rich. It couldn't really reach the people. I'm afraid we somehow have done the same thing. We have made our churches today country clubs. 
To a large extent, we're country clubs. We're pretty good about it. What about hospitals for sinners? Somebody asks me every time I go and hold a revival, someone, what's the greatest thing I can do for your revival meeting? Pray? I said, I do want you to pray, but that's not the greatest thing. What's the greatest thing? Bring 50 lost people with you when you come to church. Get 20 there. How in the world are you going to get people saved if there's nobody lost in the pews? Can I get an amen on that? Amen. Somehow or another, the revival and soul that been set aside over here and feeling a bit better about ourselves has kind of stepped into the front seat where we kind of get this together. Can I quickly say the enemies of Bible so winning today, there's a doctrine that's an enemy. It's called hyper-Calvinism. Hyper-Calvinism, you don't need to worry about it a whole lot. We ought to know, but hyper-Calvinism basically says God's already decided who's going to be saved and lost. Forget about it. Now, they don't say it that way. That's the way I'm giving it to you. That's the intent of it. The devil brings, remember I said, there's enough truth in every that is false, including the Seventh Day Adventist Church, including sometimes the Mormons, there's, they're going to say a little bit of truth once in a while. The devil puts that in there to sprinkle it in to make you give attention, and if we don't know the Bible, we step right in line with it. Hyper Calvinism is like that. The second enemy of evangelism is a philosophy, it's called lifestyle evangelism. It came out in the 80s. Lifestyle evangelism is a little bit more. It's a little bit more difficult. Lifestyle evangelism is a, suburb, a very subversive philosophy. It basically says, as Creator said, you don't need to talk to anybody. You don't need to present the gospel to anybody. You just live the life and let everybody look at you, and that's witnessing. If I wasn't as dignified as I am, I'd say baloney. It doesn't work that way. Now, I'm probably not the best Christian. I by far am not the best Christian you've ever seen. But I've been at it a while. I've never, ever had anybody walk up me on the street and, wow, I see how you're living. You're living such a good life, so close to God. Would you please tell me how to be saved? And I'm going to tell you, nobody's ever going to walk up to you and do the same thing. That's not what happened in Acts. You see, they went out door to door. They went out daily door to door. And they were winning people. Lifestyle evangelists in their philosophy knew they would fight biblical soul winning. Notice the three words I put together, biblical soul winning. They knew they would fight it, so they came up with a false term called confrontational evangelism. They say, you either practice it like we say, or you're guilty of confrontational evangelism. Who said so? I'm not a confrontational guy. I don't want to offend people when I try to present the gospel? I don't want to do that. What do I want to do? I want to win them to Christ. Then I think one of the most dangerous, and I'm coming close, and I forgive for going a minute or two long here. Please hope you'll forgive me. I think this is the most dangerous. It's inspection evangelism. Inspection evangelism. I think it's so easy to get into that. I hit it first time. Right when we started pastoring years ago, I was, we first started on Center Street over there, and we are going over there, and I was praying. I don't know why. In my 20s, I knew nothing, thought I knew everything. Anybody ever been there? <laughs> and I was praying for 13 people to get saved Sunday morning. I'd preach. We'd promote and try to pack the building out. God, give me 13 lost souls that'll get saved. Where 13 people walk down and get saved. You say, why did you say 13? I don't know. I just was praying for 13 to be saved. One Sunday morning, sure enough, they came down there, Receive Christ, fill out the altar cards, and I counted them, 13 people got saved. And I was saying, glory to God. And Monday I walked into a Christian bookstore. I walked into a Christian bookstore, and all I was seeing is 13. 13. Man, I was motivated. 13. I was excited. 13. And the guy that run the Christian bookstore, I looked at him, he said, y'all have a good day yesterday? I couldn't wait for him to ask. I said, yes, sir. We had 13 saved. He looked at me and said, hmm, how many of them in it? You ever heard anything like that? You know what he was? He was an inspector. He didn't win anybody. He poured water on real soul winners. That kept me out of Christian bookstores for years. 
I don't like negativity and things that put people down. I'm going to tell you my balloon burst. When he said, how many a minute, I said, it made me go back. Did we do something wrong? What's going on here? You know what inspection evangelism is? Inspection evangelism is when we look at it, it, it is a very confusing practice. A person must meet another person's selected agenda in order to say their faith is genuine. We sing just as I am. We preach whosoever will. But when somebody gets saved, we said, I'll wait and see. Now, you say, isn't it possible that we could have wheat and tares? Study your Bible. It's impossible not to have wheat and tares. But when Jesus comes back, he's going to separate them and take care of them. And again, I wish I had time to tell you about a lady who got saved eight years after I supposedly they won a Christ. I made a good gospel presentation. I don't have time to tell you the story, but later in the evangelism area I preached in, she got saved, and she said, I just wanted to get rid of you that night. You know what? I did my job. My job was to present the gospel and give her an opportunity to receive Christ. Now, what's the results of that? I'm giving you, just going to read quickly a list. Here's what the leaders of our churches across America are saying. This is not for me, this is for my church leaders. Here's where our churches are in America. Our church memberships contain a high percentage of seniors. Visitors very seldom attend our services, and if so, they are mostly already believers from other churches. Invitations, altar calls are virtually non-existent. The lost are not saved in our services. We baptize little or no converts. Personal workers are not needed because nobody's coming to be saved. Personal workers are not trained. People are not instantly set up in a program of, evangel of discipleship. Church growth is virtually non-existent. Our members are not bringing unsaved people to church because they see no need. Attendance promotions are frowned upon. Revivals for the lost have been abandoned. There is no enthusiasm and resources in our service no new babies in our churches. In the how-to of leading a lost person to Christ, there's confusion over witnessing because so many different philosophies are presented and so many different restrictions are put upon people. The worst thing is this. The lost are not reached. Hell is expanding. Our churches are becoming Christian country clubs. We are producing Dead Sea Christians as we march towards non-existence. Everybody says church needs revitalization, but do we want to follow the biblical remedy? Do we want to do what Christ said? I'm finished. Christ ascended. Two years later, 100,000 people have been saved and baptized in Jerusalem. Whoa. 17 years later, we come to Acts chapter 19, and because of the persecution, they spread, everybody in Asia had heard. 28 years later, we come to Colossians chapter 1 and 2, and study carefully, everybody in the then known world had been exposed to the gospel. It's during that time that James was motivating the Christians right in the middle of that era. And he said, let him know. Let him know. Let him know what, James? He that converteth the sinner from there of his way, keep at it. You're going to save people from hell and give them a brand new life. Don't quit. Slow down. But sadly, 62 years after the resurrection, are you listening? 62 years after the ascension of Christ. We come to Revelation chapter 2 and the church at Ephesus. A church that had had one of the greatest revivals in, its, in Paul, the Apostle Paul preached it. Where God gave a book, Ephesus, that has some of the greatest benefits of being a Christian in it. But we come to the church at Ephesus, Revelation chapter 2. And God said, you're rich. I appreciate you fighting people that are in false doctrine. You're taking a good stand. You're using the right Bible. Everything's good about you. 
But I got somewhat against you. You've lost your first love. And ladies and gentlemen, I don't have time to go through the Bible and show you different verses. I'll let you do that. But losing the first love was not falling out of love with Jesus Christ or falling out of love with the Bible. It was quit winning souls. They had stopped. God said, I want you to repent. What do you mean repent? I want you to go back and do the first what? Works. The first works. Acts chapter 1 and verse 2. Here's the commandments. Now, I'm going to heaven. You go and obey them. Now, every one of us in this room remember two people. You remember the first person you won to Christ, and you remember the last person you went to Christ. Each one of us do. You'll remember the first person you won to Christ and the last person you won to Christ. Let's pray. Heads about and eyes are closed. Listen carefully. Is there someone in this building right now?